Hello, everybody, and welcome all. Thanks to LD Mobile. This is NBL Overtime. Plenty to get into. Hashtag NBL Overtime at NBL to say g'day. We're going to get to Dan Shamir very shortly. Again, another exciting day for the New Zealand Breakers. Liam Santamaru, hello to you. Hi, Cam. I'm, uh, I'm enjoying the extra freedom we've got yes. this week. Get out and about a tiny little bit more and... I'm still waiting for the message from you to ask me to be your social bubble, but uh, that hasn't come through just yet. You were number two, but I'm already, I've am already got a social bubble fan and that's Homicide. Have a look at him. He's dressed up for the occasion. Have a look, man. You look good. You've had a haircut. Hello to you. Thanks, man. How you guys doing? I, I, I'm good. I've I got to just straight up. I'll put this on social media. Let's take it very easy on the cup today. Last week in a Tommy Greer chat, I took a little sip and nearly went down. <laughs> So I've got to keep that in mind. When Dan, I've got to try and finish my cup of tea before we get to Dan Shamir. Because the last thing I need to do is uh, to choke on my green tea. So that's something, oh. that, that is my one aim for today's show. Yeah. On my side. Keep, keep yourself together. Can oh. you look sharp, Corey. Thanks, You man. look sharp. I might need to get Sabrina to sort Word. of at some point. Sabrina, oh. definitely. I can't go to Brother Wolf. So I go to Queen Sabrina. <laughs> I, I, I speak for the entire nation when I say, I would love to see you with as number zero. I'd love to see you with the exact same haircut, Liam, as what Homicide's rocking. Really? Oh, yeah. well. We might, we might need to put that on a bed at some stage. Cool. <laughs> okay. Like it. All right. Let's get into some business. Dan Shamir, as I said, not too far away. Big day. Colton Iverson has announced. We'll get to that in a split second. But the news in the last 24 or so hours, and it's not overly surprising with the NBL push back the start date on the recommendation from the committee that's been put together uh, mid-January. Of course, Victoria, when it comes to the states and the two teams, Melbourne United and South East Melbourne Phoenix, really the most affected. But mid-January, homicide, when you hear the news... I'm going to go to you first. It's disappointing, but, you know, fairly understandable, right? Definitely understandable. You know, safety, first and foremost, is the most important thing here. And we're not, when I say we're, because I work for the NBL, you know, we're not a league that can do extremely well. I don't think any league could do extremely well without bums on seats. You need the fans. That's the bloodline of the league. You know, we have some of the best fans in the world, super passionate about their teams. They love basketball. It's a great family atmosphere. And we need that. You know, that's that's how the success of the league has continued to grow. So, you know, if it has to get pushed back to mid-January, it is what it is. I agree. Smart decision. It's the right decision. We've spoken before, like, uh, we, as a league... Um, there's, we have flexibility. So use that flexibility to make the right decision. Don't, don't need to rush this. Take out, let's get it right or as right as it possibly can be. One of the things, talking to people around all the clubs, um, they're just looking for certainty wherever they can find it in really uncertain times. And a lot of that is kind of pleading to the NBL. Like, could you just give us something concrete that can we, we can work with? So to announce that it's... At the earliest, it's going to be mid-January. Just enables them to get their plan, get their ducks in line, and adjust their planning accordingly. So, um, good decision, smart decision, and hopefully, we can get the numbers down. We can get everything sorted, and that can actually be the time we can get going and get roaring into what's going to be a really good season. Of course, both Melbourne teams, in particular Melbourne United, because South East Melbourne Phoenix last year played a couple of games out at the State Basketball Centre. They, the whole of January is locked out with uh, Melbourne Park and, and Melbourne Arena, of course, with the tennis. So to start a season in, in mid-January, if it was the case, those two teams go on the road, maybe the first four or five games. I know we're a long way away from this. It could, in a weird way, work for Melbourne United and South East Melbourne Phoenix on the back end of the year. It might be stacked with home games leading into the last month of the NBL season, it gains that momentum. We, we watched it last year, the team that played better at the end of the year, and Melbourne United was one of them. Sydney, of course, were dominant from day dot. But Perth got their best basketball going into the finals. And we've seen that in all sports. It could, in a weird way, work for United and Phoenix, where the second half of the year will be jam-packed with home games, and they can use that to propel something, if, as long as they're able to win a couple of games on the road early. Maybe. Mm -hmm. um... 
but you know, like we see all kinds of different things play out in NBL season, right? We team saw a team in New Zealand a few years ago just killed in Sydney under Andrew Gaze, killed the whole first year, yeah. and then fell up mm-hmm. off a cliff and, and didn't make the finals. And then we see a team like New Zealand who had a similar situation last season on the road. Mm-hmm. They got going on the road in the sort of second half of the season and uh, just didn't quite get over the line. So it could. I mean, it's going to be. It's intriguing either way. It's going to be different. Teams cool. are going to have to play stretches yeah. on the road that they wouldn't usually. We might have hubs. We're still looking at that. <laughs> Everyone needs to stay flexible and adaptable if they're going to be successful this season. Uh, I don't know about you, Homicide. And I, look, the hubs is an interesting one because I think it's great for, say, people like us who may not be in the hubs, but we're able to watch it on TV every night. It's going to be cool. Now, I'm not sure financially how viable it is. But we raised this. If you're going to have a hub, have it in cans. Because the old, I think, and I, I think it was you, Land. Did you drop a nickname of it in, in our WhatsApp group? I don't want to steal it. What have you called it? No, I stole it. I can't. I don't know where I saw it, but the snag pit, the old Bunnings. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Imagine the snag pit looks amazing. It looks great from the photos yes. Cairns put up in the last couple of days. That it's going to be a cool place, hub or otherwise, for the Cairns Taipans and their fans to to spend time in. I agree. You know, we're. I mean, I know we're not playing, but I'm sure everybody just can't wait for the season to begin. Whatever you have to adjust to will be the easy part, as long as you know that the season has began. Yep. So that's just the most important thing. Basketball, you're going to be able to play anywhere. Indoor, if you got to go to Cairns, if you got to go to Sydney, if you got to go to New Zealand, if you got to go to Perth, wherever, you may end up. No problem. Let's just play. Everybody will be more than happy to be playing because this is the longest uninjured, under contract players have ever been yeah. in between seasons. Mm-hmm. You know what else? Um, we're going to see some really high-level players in the league that will be here because it's been pushed back. Yeah. Because we're starting at that time. Now, usually our, our time works for a different reason. Team players know that they're going to get finished by a certain time so they can pick up a, a deal in Europe or back in the G League or something like that. But we're going to see different players. Like Donald Sloan, for instance is coming to the NBL. A big reason why is because he's about to have a baby and he's going to be able to spend some time with that kid before he has to come over and get started with the 36ers. Colton Iverson is in a very, very similar position. And the fact that the competition is going to start a little bit later works really well for him and there's going to be more guys like that. You know, I'm a silver lining type of guy. I'm a half glass full guy. Uh, For basketball fans, and I understand the frustration, the disappointment, and the fact it's been nudged back just a little bit. 2021, WNBL, of course, NBL, regardless of what basketball you love, on our own shores, high-class players, it's going to roll straight into the Olympics. Then it's going to roll straight in almost into the NBL 22 season. So, uh, look, right, it'll be a short off-season, you would think, between the next NBL season and the one after it. We see a Tasmanian team come in as well. So as, as bad as it is right now and people are going through much different things in different parts of the country, if you're a hardcore basketball fan, 2021 is going to be five levels above what we might have ever seen, Liam. And yeah. that psychs me. I hear you. And excuse my friends, but 2020 is a piece of shit. I agree. But hard, to, hard to, disagree. To, just, to just get right away from it, start in the new year, yeah. feels good. Uh, I, well, what else also feels good, Homicide? I think I'm now the only person on the NBL Overtime panel not to swear on air. I think you dropped the magic in a Mitch Creek interview a little while ago. Now Liam's working blue. No, I'm, just, I'm just passionate about how bad this year has been. <laughs> it's hard to argue with it too. Man, it's, it, it, it's going to be a big year though, Homicide, isn't it? Except for, the, of course, the US national team when the Boomers beat them in Tokyo and then we're going to give you the razz up on this show. Definitely. I'm um, looking forward to it like everybody else. Looking forward to 2021. Is, is that the type of attire you're going to wear for the rest of the off season is this the standard you've set for yourself now no okay right. you didn't get the memo about collars cam like i don't read my emails <laughs> <laughs> might just step it up a little <laughs> i'll step it up when the season's on i'm in relaxo mode <laughs> <laughs> All right. i'll tell you who is not in relaxo mode and we're going to get very shortly to dan shamir but it's the breakers because they've had a hell of an off season i, I can imagine like everyone they just they just they're like Christmas Eve, they just want to unwrap the presents. And they've added another piece, Colton Iverson, big boy, seven-footer, and he's going to fit perfectly. While he might not stuff the stat sheet, he's great for what they've got. Liam Sandemarie's article is up on nbl.com.au on the the NBL app now, having a deep look at him. Tell me and everyone else a little bit about the big boy. Great addition. 
I really like the, the fit, the balance that he is. As you say, big, strong unit, and um, he's a role player. He's going to come in and play a role, but with terrific experience coming out of the Euro League, um, and, uh, you know, terrific in the pick and roll. Um, and uh, it does a lot of things very differently to what Rob Lowe does. So good to have a different skill set there at the five. They can play together at times um, and a high character guy. So, you know, they, they were looking at maybe, you know, like going with a big time athlete. I like the fact that they didn't, they didn't go with like a Sean Long or a Cam Oliver, like a, a, a guy who... Um, he's going to need the rock and wants to score a whole bunch of... They've got so much talent on that team whom the ball is going to be with. They've got the right kind of player, I think, in this dude to come in and... Man, I mean, if they're not the champ... If, right now, with Bryce Cotton not an Aussie, they're the championship favourites. I'm waiting for you, Homicide, because you've been saying this for a couple of months now and this, by no stretch of the imagination, will take you away from that thought. They're definitely contenders. Um, I'm just waiting to see what he brings. I'm pretty sure this organization is not getting any pieces that does not help them and does not add value. So um, I'm just looking forward to seeing, you know, what he does when he gets here. You, you, you've wound back the blueprint just a little bit. I know that it didn't exactly fall the way that you expected, but you still wound it back. So now you want to be a little more conservative in your prediction of them making a grand final. They're championship contenders, 100%. Okay. Hashtag NBL over time to get involved. We're going to add uh, Colton Iverson, of course, to the New Zealand depth chart. That's around 10 minutes away. But before all of that, Dan Shamir, the head coach of the Breakers, to join us. And while we wait for him to jump online, here's a little bit of the big seven-footers highlight reel. Renfro. Around Thomas, into the lane, created a better room. Tough shot. And how about Colton Iverson? On the follow. Renfro sends it outside. Abramaitis will send it back. Renfro will look for three. Doesn't get it, but what a putback from Colton Iverson. Oh, he went through there like an arrow. Shot clock at five. Iverson steps through and finishes. So great timeout by Coach Plaza. Zenit trying to pull it back to within the shot. Iverson. Oh, goes all on his own and throws it down. And the lead is back to four. Renfro. Renfro into Iverson to answer back. Crowd getting a little agitated here at the Subur Arena. Vivers takes it inside and gets his shot well and truly swatted. Get out of here. Oh, He's a big boy and he's exciting and we're excited to announce, of course, that this morning it went around the, the announcement this morning that Colton Iverson had signed for the New Zealand Breakers, their second import spot. And we've spoken a little bit about it off the top, but this is going to be a huge, huge coup for the New Zealand Breakers and the head coach, Dan Shamir, joins us to talk all about it. Dan, welcome to NBL Overtime. Thank you. Uh, we're excited to see the big boy, which means you're probably tenfold because he, he seems to fit beautifully in what you're building there. Yeah, we... We actually, it's, it, it took us some time to find that uh, last, last piece. And uh, personally, I'm very happy to uh, have a guy like uh, Colton. He's, uh, I played against him a few times uh, recently, two years ago, when he played for Tenerife, a, team, a good team in Spain. And um, he's, uh, he's exactly what we were looking for, a system guy who's, uh, um, who knows all the little nuances of... Uh, or the little reads uh, at, uh, of the system that we're trying to build here. And um, I feel we have a good, talented group and a lot of creators and Corey and Ty and Lamar. And uh, these guys need a guy like that who plays hard, who knows the game, who brings the IQ. And I couldn't be happier. Coach, uh, long time no speak, mate. Uh, how's, uh, how's life over there? Well, uh, the beginning was great, uh, besides the lockdowns, obviously, but I was, I still am. I feel very fortunate to be here. Uh, it's a great part of the world to be at uh, during these uh, um, president at times, but um, it's been a while if to be open with you guys uh, that uh, I'm getting uh, already a little anxious uh, to, to be so long without a game mm. and uh, without the competition. A guy like me, I coached forever, and yeah. I 
I feel the stress of the of the business usually i i I'm used to ten months seasons and you finish the season and you automatically move into a national team competition and building the team and you're under constant stress and I always thought it would be great to take some time off and to be <laughs> just in you know just take a vacation and I always told everybody I can do with I can do life without coaching I can just grow tomatoes or, and sit at home and watch Netflix all day <laughs> and it didn't take me a while to understand that it's not the case. And I actually talked about it to a lot of friends, coaches, and we can't leave without the competition. So it's been a while. And if the season, resume, or the season starts January 15th, it's going to be 11 months without a game for me. And uh, we need to get there already. So if you guys can do something about it, find a vaccine or <laughs> you know, whatever it takes, I'd be appreciative. Hey, Coach, um, how happy are you that your, your recruiting has finished? You know, you got the core, and we all know how valuable the locals are to any team that's successful. So how great was it to early in the offseason lock that in with your local players? Coming into the, again, these unique circumstances uh, when it started, um, I felt we got so lucky get, having, um, having even, having, even just getting Rob Lowe towards uh, the end of the season and have him uh, locked in and uh, for sure guys like Finn and Corey. Get, just getting into the off season, we knew we had a team, but still, um, you know, imports you can always, if you're patient enough, you'll always find imports and uh, the market is, always big you can always uh, you're going to search there are always players out there uh, but when the league moved to two imports only um, I still felt that uh, without a good piece local piece we're not going to be what we hope uh, to be which is you know to compete for for a title and to contend and getting tie was uh, uh, probably the main the, ma the major step of this offseason and um, and then just being now four months away from the season with uh, just having the ability to plan and to have uh, a lot of experienced guys uh, who know what we want to do. Uh, it's a unique situation for me. I've never been in this situation that you can plan so uh, uh, so deeply, so far away from the season. Hey, you, you lose, for me, one of the top two players in the league. But you gain two-time first team all NBL in Lamar Patterson. You know, although I'm sure, you know, Scotty was your guy. I know you all you all had a great relationship. You all loved him down there. But if you're going to substitute out Scotty cuz Scotty, you know, just didn't work out and to get Lamar Patterson, how lucky was that to know you have another superstar that's reliable in this league? Well, this is why we did that. It's um it's not a secret and I you know, I'd be very happy to share that uh, everybody knows we, once the season ended, we, uh, in our mindset, we wanted to bring Scotty back. And um, this, these things take time in our business and players want to see and explore and see what their options are. Uh, and I'm usually patient with that. I understand the nature of the business. And um, again, the season was quite far away and uh, we did not, we were not under pressure, but once we had the opportunity to bring a guy who's just as good for us and mm. we think is, ju is just as, uh, he has the same greatness and he can be a focal point for, for us and it was so hard to play against, then we were comfortable in moving into that direction. It was, I like to do business on all accounts, signing players and uh, even building my own career in an easy way, when it makes sense for everybody, where, where business is done in a good way, where, where it's not a struggle to sign a guy. And this is how it went with Lamar. Where the communication was good from the beginning. He wanted to be here. We were uh, reasonable. It made a lot of sense for us. That, that's why we, we made this move.
It, you, you mentioned, of course, the, the, the long off season. It might be 11 months from the end of NBL 20 until the, to the restart. But just, just take us back to last year. Of course, uh, limited preparation with some of you guys, with you coming in. And then, of course, there was the World Championship. So a lot of guys on international representation. You had an injury and oh, injuries. Scotty Hobson, you, you mentioned Rob Lowe, who got that, that elbow earlier in the year to the, to the head. You had the Glenn Ross Jr. situation. So there was some controversy and some starts and stops. But then you got going. Second half of the year was brilliant. When the season ended, what was your thoughts on the NBL as a competition, but also where the club was and where your team was going into an off-season? We needed another show for, to, to analyze everything that happened last <laughs> year. Fair. I remember Liam, Liam, I don't know if you remember our conversation in uh, probably OK, Oklahoma airport or wherever it was about season. Um, yeah. Again, you know, being open with you, as much as I researched and I watched this league a lot uh, in the last uh, four or five years before I came here, and uh, as much as I could uh, study uh, where, what I'm getting into, I didn't know uh, what, what I was getting into. And there was a, a, a very difficult set of circumstances. You mentioned some of them, not as an excuse, uh, but um, the beginning was very uh, tough on all accounts. But the main thing was, for me, naturally, the process that I went uh, through, uh, building relationships with the people around me and, uh, and just building a program, you know, picking up the, just understanding the players and building uh, the, the relation within the staff. I, I had none. I had nothing of it. And uh, again, in all honesty, it's very different where I'm come from, where I'm coming from. Uh, just the nature of how things are done, and I, ent I, I entered a lot of obstacles. And the main thing about last season is seeing how all these difficulties were resolved, how people, uh, how it all came together, and uh, we learned to play uh, in a certain way, and we adjusted to each other. Me. In, you know, I felt it on myself a lot in the way I communicate with people and even, even in the way in how much we practice and how the week is structured and, and, um, and also, you know, hats off and a lot of credit to the staff around, you know, everybody in the building and mainly the players who bought in and who said, you know, the key guys in the program, Tom Abercrombie and Finn and Corey and Rob, they, during the season, they said, this is, you know, the way we're going, we can be good in this NBL, in this competitive NBL. We can be good like that. If we play with this kind of system, with this kind of discipline and structure, etc., we can be good. And we just need to keep going. And uh, luckily for me, there was a 180 turn in the results. So the first part of the season, we were horrific. And the second part of the season, we were by numbers at least and wins were probably one of the best teams in, in the NBL. And then, therefore, everybody kind of um, gained confidence in, in, in who we are. And we felt we have a lot to build on. And uh, we added some good pieces. And now all we need is the season to begin. Okay, This is exactly what we need to happen. So we can maybe, <laughs> you know, see the fruits of all this uh, painful process. Rich, you mentioned uh, growing tomatoes before is there a chance that you turning vegan might soften you up a little bit this season nah how <laughs> do you know about that hey i've done my research yeah well i'm not uh, religious about my nutrition but i'm experimenting and again you know this is something that i felt all my life the season finishes and in one or two days it takes me personally it takes me around two days you decompress and you start recalling and start doing things that you don't do during the season. And, you know, in the past, it always occurred to me that I need to pick up the phone and call this guy that I said something wrong to and I need to apologize to that coach or whatever. And this offseason, I've been trying to figure out uh, how I preserve, you know, my, my physical uh, shape. Uh, in, my, in my age, uh, Liam, we're not in the same age. You need to think about preserving. So uh, I'm experimenting with a few things, but it's not going to change my coaching style. Where is your assistant coach? This is the hype man. <laughs> I love him. 
I think that your team went to another level with him on the sideline because he is an extension of you on the sideline. You know, you're in the game, you're focused, dealing with what's going on, the next play, the next few plays. He can deal with a lot of the other stuff that he needs to help you deal with, which is, you know, the personality of the players when they're coming off the bench. Talk to us about the relationship you've had with him and where does that stem from? So we spoke a little bit about last year, last season, and um, there were a few pivotal uh, moments in this season in kind of uh, speeding up the process of uh, building uh, who we are. Getting Modi is probably the first one. And, um, um, you know, we've, we worked together for, for a long time. And um, this, is, this is part of, when I say adjusting to each other, this was part of the adjustment that a lot of people had to do to us because this is for me coaching. Modi is a, is, is a head coach in who he is. You know, he's, um, he's a great basketball mind and he's a great everything. He's a great character and he's very knowledgeable and he's great with uh, working out individually with the players and he's great with his film sessions. It's great on all accounts. And one thing about me as a coach, and I told everybody over here when I came, not only my assistants, everybody around me, I always had and I need uh, very strong characters around me. And um, my one of the things that are very present in my coaching style is I'm very much aware of the conflict that I'm in with the players. Uh, I, for me, basketball is very against structures and uh, structured and the, the rules are very clear and, and what you should do and what you shouldn't do is clear. And there is some freedom, don't get me wrong, but I also have a lot to say about everything. And it's, uh, it's all, it's most of the time it's, don't do that. I don't want you to do that. And at the same time, I want players that are big egos and believe that they can do a lot and, and they want to do more. They want to take more shots. They want to, they want to, they tell me this is a good shot for me. And I tell him, I don't want you to take this shot and I want you to pass and I want you to cut there, but he wants to stay there. So it's a constant, it's not a, you know, it's a constant kind of conflict. That's what it is. And therefore I need, a lot of good, strong characters around, around me to kind of finish the job. And I like to stay away in a lot of, in a lot of situations. And I want to, I, sometimes I, and the, 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 the borders are very clear to me. I don't go to the locker room all the time. I like it. I like the, the place to have the locker room. And, and, uh, and therefore I have a lot of philosophies and theories about, about my, who is the coach in a team, as you can see. And I need guys like that. And when Modi came here, for a lot of people, it was, what is he doing? How, how come he's talking too much? And how, you know, what is, who does he think he is? And for us, it was funny. Yeah, this is coaching. This is what it is, getting the job done. And the players love him. And for me, it's great. And, you know, having him for another two years while, you know, I'm here in the long term, it's also another big step for me and for the club, and uh, and you nailed it. It's a it's a big one. You, you talk about the importance of of certain personalities within the group, the team, the coaching staff, the the role that those people play. Talk to me about Thomas Abercrombie and how important he is to everything that you do as a team. I feel like as a player, as a personality, he's a, he seems like a really good fit with what you're trying to get done with that team. So one of the first things that uh, uh, I do when I start a season or when I come to a team, definitely when I go to a new situation, is try to recognize who are the forces, who are the owners in the team. And it's actually one of the first questions I ask a team. Who are the owners over here? And that also, again, goes into the, the, the notion that I'm really, uh, I really believe in that the coaches are important, but the players are more important. And the cliche that they have the ball in their hands is real. And that in the crucial game, in the crucial moments of a season, in a big game, I've been in a few of those 
where everything is at stake and you're approaching the last four or five minutes of a cup game or a big championship game or final four. And, and in the last, during those last moments, you're on the bench and you cannot do a lot. And they are, they are doing everything on the other side of the floor. And, and therefore, I'm, I'm looking for these guys. Who are the, who are the, the forces? And Tom, uh, and I also want it to be done in a very genuine way. So people who just scream and yell cliches and, and stuff they read in some books uh, doesn't do it. You know, people don't really believe to people like that. And I just cut to the, the end of the season. Scotty Hobson told me, and he's an experienced guy, and he's, he's been around, been in the NBA, and a few really teams. Scotty said at the end of the season, Tom is the best captain I've ever had. And I had another player telling me something. We had an incident during the season, and he said, the way Tom looked at me, I understood he doesn't accept this kind of stuff on his team. And in all honesty, I never heard stuff like that from players, mm. but another player. Uh, we all knew he's a great guy, and everybody wants him, wants a friend like that, but uh, it's great to see. You don't know that before it happens. It's great to see a guy like that having such great influence on the people around him. By example, he's not a big talker. And um, the main thing is that I didn't know how good he was as a player, mm. you know, he, he just, um, the evolution of his role on the team was enormous. I will admit that I was worried when I studied him before I came. I saw him in the previous year and he had a pretty average World Cup campaign. And I thought to myself, what am I gonna do with this important player who is the captain of the team and he's the face of the team what is he? Is he just going to wait in the corner and, and wait for people to pass him the ball to make a shot here and there? How? And it, he moved from that into being a guy that we want the ball in his hands a lot, and yeah. everyone plays for him, and and um, that's why he is right now. And he ended up having, you know, one of the best seasons a player ever had. And I, you know, you know, I can talk for thirty minutes about Tom, so I will I will just finish <laughs> with, with with that. I think that if I had met him not being arrogant, but just if I, if, if we were working when he was younger, in a situation like that, in a place like that, when he was like 26, 27, mm -hmm. he would have moved from here to a very good situation in a top European team. I've coached, you know, in clubs that pay $2 million to their players. Mm. And every team is looking for a player like Tom Abercrombie, a 6'6 athlete who can defend everybody, who makes shots, who doesn't make a lot of mistakes. Mm. He belongs at the top. He's one of the best I've ever had. And, um, and let's stop here because we don't want to make it a, a, a 90 minute Tom Abercrombie. <laughs> <laughs> Any last words, Homicide, before we let Dan go? I think you have a championship contending roster, and good luck to you. Thanks. Uh, please don't put so much pressure on us. Uh, we just want to, you know, we, we joke in other places, you can't drop from the NBL, but uh, we joke that the, per the, the goal is to stay in the league. But we definitely uh, know that we have, we have a lot of good pieces and we should be contenders, but the work is to learn to play together and the, whole, the world is just ahead of us. Uh, the whole work is ahead of us. So. Let's hope we get there and we start the, the process. Dan, we appreciate your time as you touched on those steps of putting that, that roster together is uh, all being completed. So we're going to look at the depth chart in a second at New Zealand. We're going to go through that. But thank you for joining us. And no doubt we'll join, be joined by you again in NBL over time over the course of the season, mate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care and I'll see you soon. Time to have a look at that New Zealand depth chart. They're putting these teams together. Let's have a look at it right now. Hashtag NBL Overtime to get involved. Dan Shamir into the New Zealand depth chart. There it is. It looks great. Colton Iverson added, of course, with the announcement today. And it's a, it's a roster that we've spoken so much, so much about. 
so much about. Dan just spoke about the fact that Ty Webster, they had to get that local piece. They got it. Abercrombie's still there, of course. Finn Delaney, who was really good in the second half of the year after getting over some injuries. Lamar Patterson. They do look good, Homicide. I, you know, obviously, as, as Coach just said, we've got to put this together, but they've done a wonderful job in the off-season of putting together a crew that's going to be really, really good, you would think, especially on paper. The ingredients to a championship-winning team is, one, mm-hmm. front office, two, coaching staff, experienced coaching staff that know how to win have a great plan going into games. They showed us they're able to do that in the second half of the season. Experienced players, players that have won championships, national team players, international players, as locals. Then you nail it with your imports. Mm -hmm. They've ticked all the boxes in the off season. Coming off of what they were able to do, the way they finished up the season, They didn't get to finals, but that was the best thing they could have done. And then on top of it, retaining that local core. This is why I feel this is a team. They should go to the grand finals. I agree. I agree. And this is is what I was talking about, about Colton Iverson and why I think he's a really good fit is I think um, bringing him in is a recognition of the fact that you've got some real studs as Mm -hmm. locals. You know, so you you need to have some balance within your roster. And I, I think that they've got that with, with this addition. I'm not saying he's not a high-level guy. Just his skill set and what he brings, the way he plays, is more of a role-playing type. Doesn't need the ball in his hands a lot. And, um, you know, really high-character dude. And it's going to I think it's going to work out really well. It's interesting. We look at that depth chart, right? And that's based on what the breakers... We didn't ask Dan about it today. But what they've told me about how they see their lineup right now. And you, a lot of it's why I asked him about Tom Abercrombie because I feel like so much of it pivots around him. Dan Shamir wants Tom Abercrombie on the floor. So you look at that roster and you go, well, you'll start the Websters and you put Lamar Patterson at the three and then you have Finn Delaney at the four and the big fellas up front. He wants Tom Abercrombie on the floor a lot of the time. And... That's why I think it, a lot of it moves around that. Now, is that how they're going to roll it out with Patterson at the two? Corey Webster coming off the bench? Who knows? We'll see. Um, but they've got so much talent to work with. And um, one more spot to fill in a local off the bench. Maybe that's Ethan Rusbatch, somebody, somebody like that. We'll see. Um, and then they, it's going to be interesting to see whether they decide to bring in an next star because they were really well and truly in that next star's game. My understanding now is they're like, we don't have a lot of holes to fill. We don't have a lot of minutes available. So look, if it's the right guy and the right situation, we don't have to guarantee anything. Sure. But um, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see whether they end up going down that road. It's not dissimilar to the conversation we had last week uh, with depth and, you know, not having to play 10 guys in the first quarter and you go too deep. Sometimes it can be somewhat problematic in there. There's only one pill. There's only one basketball out there. And you Ty Webster, Corey Webster, you know, Abercrombie, the ball in the hands, as you touched on. So New Zealand, I know we're, we're a little way out from the year, but it does look like they've been able to nail it. Uh, I think it was Matt Walsh in your article, Liam. Apologies if it was Dan Shamir. But the fact is that the season being pushed back a little bit at the time around the December mark gave them a deep breath moment. Oh, we got this. Now we're able to scale the world and find a guy who's going to be able to fit in nicely. And it looks like, from all reports, that is Colton. Iverson and it's, it's exciting and they, they, they could spend a lot of time in Australia but they also with the experience you touch on their homicide and, and guys who are used to traveling and doing it at the highest level be it national level or at the world champs or Olympics or internationally whatever it might be they're a crew that aren't going to be phased by being away out of their natural habitat a little bit you'd think of uh, of their home gym I think they do their the, the better of their work on the road if I'm not correct last season they were make they were going they were making plays happen. They they made a run at the end of the year that was super impressive. So I have no reason to doubt that team. All right. Anything else on New Zealand? I just think also like um they've got some really good continuity coming into this year. It was one of the th- one of the reasons why I guaranteed at this point last year that they weren't going to make the finals is they didn't there was really none, right? Like there was um 
big turnover with the roster, brand new coach. They'd had this heavily disrupted preseason and there wasn't time to kind of bring all those pieces together. And there's, you know, we know how big time continuity is in this league. So, you know, you hear Dan talking about what they all learnt last season, what he learnt, how he's changed as a bit of a coach um, and his approach in terms of practices, how long they spend on the floor, how he communicates to players. All that that they learnt last season, the addition of a couple of key pieces, and they are good to go. All right. We spoke about the snag pit which is going to be the best name, uh, Jim Wise, in NBL 21. Love it. It looks great. If you haven't checked it out, make sure you check it out, NBL website, uh, the app, or on the Cairns Taipans. They put it up the uh, last couple of days. But let's have a look at this Cairns Taipans depth chart because, look, it, it really does. I'm not saying the whole thing. A lot of talent there, of course, as you can see. But it hinges on Machado and Oliver. We all believe that Machado is coming back, but until there's that official announcement, who knows? And Oliver, as, as Liam Santa Maria reported you know, a couple of months ago now, you know, there's a hell of a lot of European interest, as there would be probably in both those guys. Where do you want to start with this depth chart? I'll start with you, Homicide. Like, who steps up? Who's the DJ Newble squeezed out probably with the three down the two imports. He's on to Japan. You know, he's a Mojave king. Uh, Jericho was outstanding in the second half of the year. Quat Noy had his injuries, but was great. They've got the crew there to be able to fill that breach of having no DJ Newbel, who, of course, was the defensive player of the year. Well, Mojave King is going to have an incredible opportunity to show what he can do. Um, this thing really stems on if they can get back that incredible superstar point guard that they have. He is the the the... <laughs> the guy that makes this whole thing go. So if they are not able to the, retain the services of Scott Machado, they are in trouble. Let's be clear. They will be in trouble. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Nothing else really matters. They got to get him back. That's how dynamic and important he is to the pieces, to uh, Kane's type ends. They don't get Machado back. They're in trouble, man. Nothing else matters to me. Well, they might else, I'm sure matters to them. Hey. They're not going to get Cam Oliver. He killed in Israel. The price done went up. I am sure of this. So you better figure out a way to make sure Machado's coming back. You know what I find really interesting about Cam Oliver? Hey, you're, a, you're bang on with everything about Scott Machado. And you're bang on that they know that. You know, because they're all over it. What I find interesting about Cam Oliver is Euroleague's getting started mm-hmm. and he's not on any of those rosters. Mm-hmm. We talked about those big teams that were having those big time conversations with him. Well, right now he's not sitting in any of their jerseys and uh, rolling out in any of those games. Mine, I'm told right now he's focused on the NBA, talking to multiple NBA teams, having those conversations. But the fact that he's, and how we know he's an NBA level talent could very well make that happen. But the fact that he's not on any of those EuroLeague rosters right now, as that thing's getting started, makes me feel more confident. Mm-hmm. More confident that he could be back in the Orange because now it just relies on whether he can get it done in the NBA. And we wish him well. We hope he does. I mean, we all love watching Tory Craig out there doing unbelievable things after his time in the NBL. We hope that's the same thing for Cam Oliver and Jay Sean Tate and these types of guys. But if not... Would love to have him back in far north Queensland. You will, Machado and Oliver. If they announce, if they get, if, get them both back, good luck. And this is the I love this about the NBL and, and so many of the clubs right now. Good luck getting a ticket into the snag pit. Like good luck. <laughs> like seriously, like it was it was so fun to watch last year. I think you and I, Liam, did the last game where they played Illawarra uh, at the time. And it was like a party in there. They were great. They were going to playoffs. It was a cool atmosphere. You know, Cairns loves them. The community up in far north Queensland, they love what they do. On a, on, they, they love them even when they're not successful. So when they're going well, it goes to a new level. That'll be the hottest ticket in town by that far. You'll, you'll have to... We, we could see games sold out a month in advance. <laughs> like, and I think that is great for Cairns. It's going to be great for the league. And Machado and Oliver, we both love them. But if they're able to do that and just go, bang, we're back. Good luck getting a ticket. Yeah. Good sure. luck. I mean, the setup I looks good from the photos that we've seen. Yep. Um, I will say they've ticked all the boxes in terms of the roster that mm-hmm. they can up to this point, right? In terms of making sure they've got all those key pieces around. Like, yes, it's built around 
those superstars being in the lineup and making taking them to that level. But for what they have been able to do, they've got all that done. And yeah. Jawai's back and Jarek and uh, Kawat Noy was, a, was a, play, a mutual option and he's back in the lineup. And you mentioned Mojave King. Loving watching the, the workout videos that are coming out from him up there with Derek Rucker. Um, he's going to be so good. Cannot wait to watch him out there um, in the NBL. And um, hey, they're going to be a super exciting team to watch no matter how it plays out. You, you know that occasionally homicide go, in fact, we all, in particular you and I, Corey, go a little early with predictions. I, this rookie class is stacked and I can't wait to see them. get. I love Mojave King. I, I, I think he'll be rookie of the year. And I, I, and I and will he? Well, do you think he'll start? Because I think that is almost key. Does he start or Jerick start? I think Jerick will start to begin with. Okay. Yeah, but this kid's so talented. There's every chance he's just going to play. Is what mm-hmm. like you can't keep him out of the can't keep him out by the end of the year. I mean, there's there's a very reasonable chance that could happen. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to seeing these young players play. I'm hearing a lot about King. You know, obviously, Josh Giddy as well. Yeah. I haven't seen him personally play. Um, I'm just waiting to see. You know, regardless of what, of what, we wish them well. But know this, this ain't a cupcake league. You know what I think we're going to see with those guys? We're going to see a little bit of what happened with Lamella. Not to the same extent, but a little bit where Lamella came over here as an early second-round projected guy. And then what he was able to show in the NBL... Whew, Send him flying up those draft boards. I don't see Josh Gideon Mojave King, strangely enough, on like the, the ESPN mock drafts for next year right now. But I think, I don't, where are they? They should be on there. And I think the fact that they're not out there on the floor and haven't shown that yet is probably a big reason why. But my prediction is that once those guys get out there, um, we're, they're going to fly up those boards. Hashtag NBL overtime, homicide. Any, any, any last thoughts from you? I, I don't want to go too deep into it because I know we've got to wrap. But did I see you tweeting something about how the NBL has to bring back an all-star game recently? No. No. Okay. <laughs> I thought you tweeted. I thought you tweeted something. I apologise. The, the NBL needs to bring back the all-star game at some point. I do agree with you. I was going to agree with you, but if you didn't do it, you didn't do it. We're out of here. <laughs> Hashtag NBL overtime. I'm, I'm going to go on to Twitter right now and find it. Liam, thank you. Homicidal. Thanks to LD Mobile. Hashtag NBL overtime. We'll see you next week.